uh, and is that yeah, I think. Much more. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Can the University of Oviedo hear me? I don't see any hands. University of Brest, uh, Britannia Occidental in Ghent. Maybe they're following and, uh, yeah, and all the partners of uh, the consortium. So this meeting, welcome to the official kickoff of the IMBSC program, the International Master in Marine Biological Resources. So this is, a uh, uh, we're very proud today to, to give this, uh, master program an official kickoff, not in Ghent, because we are kind of used in the previous program to organize a lot of things at Ghent University and we're very happy to do it this time in the University of the Algarve. Uh, also because the Uni University of the Algarve in the past years and also this year has uh, quite a big group of students and so it's better maybe to do it at the place also where the majority of students of this program are available. I, however, would like to uh, first give the floor to uh, some people that are here from the university uh, official uh, kind of boards. So, first of all, I would like to welcome uh, Professor Anna de Freitas, Vice Rector of the University of the Algarve, and also Professor Lourdes uh, Cristiano, Head of the Faculty, and uh, Kari Merzini, the local coordinator here of the IMBSC program, uh, told me that you uh, would be happy to uh, briefly. Uh, give a, a short talk to the audience. So may I introduce you, uh, so we would be very keen to listen to your words. On behalf of the rector, welcome to the University of Algarve and to in the, uh, Mundus Master uh, in Marine Biological Resources, IMBRC kickoff event. Marine science and fisheries have been an important part of the development of our university since the beginning. In fact, one of the first undergraduate degrees of the university was the Licenciatura in Biologia Marine e Pescas. This is because the Algarve is the continental Portugal region with the highest dependency on marine and coastal <coughs> environmental uh, in, in terms of employment and economy, with tourism and fisheries of great importance. Portugal is a country with strong links into the sea. Because of a surge in Madeira Islands, we have one of the largest exclusive economic zones in the world. With the extinction of the continental shelf, it could reach 4 million of, uh, square uh, meters, uh, kilometers. It is therefore not surprising that one of the key strategies of the Universidad, University of the Algarve is to focus on the blue economy and to develop teaching and research in marine-related rel areas. Today, the University of Algarve is national international leader in the teaching, teaching and research in marine science and fisheries, with undergraduate degrees in marine biology and marine science, master's degrees in aquaculture and fisheries, marine biology, marine and coastal systems, marine biodiversity and conservation, and starting this year, the Mundus Master in Marine Biological Research, IMBRC uh, at University of Algarve. 
uh, we have also marine related PhD programs and as an international uh, reputation in the marine science through its research centers, uh, CCMR and CIMA, uh, we have a, a, a lot of effort on, in this area. Internalization is also an important part of the WALK strategy. In recent years, international students from more than 60 countries have made up a significant proportion of student body. The new Mundus Master in Marine Biological Research is a welcome addition into marine-related educational offer of our university, contributing to our main strategic lines. In fact, IMBRC is a continuation of the highly successful EMBC and EMBC Plus programs. From academic years from 2008-2009 and to 2016-17, we have received nine cohorts of EMBC, EMBC Plus students who choose to start a walk, uh, at WALK. In total, 214 students from 37 different countries choose to study here during the first year of uh, EMBC, EMBC Plus, making this one of the most successful master's programs of, at our university. Many more students came here during their second year to do an internship or thesis research. From the numbers of EMBRC students starting at well, this academic year, 38, there is no doubt that uh, this program is going to be just as successful, if not even more successful. While you are here, you will be talked by faculty members and researchers from both CCMR and CIMA, and we hope you will have opportunities to be expo exposed to research carried out at these centers, and that many of you will come back to do your thesis research at our <coughs> university. In addition to science, Faro is the capital of Algarve, the most touristic region of Portugal, and represents, therefore, an ideal platform to foster not only an international ship exchange of knowledge and ideas, but also to promote friendship and partnership among the participants. Therefore, we wish you all good work and a very good stay at Faro. Thank you. Good afternoon to everybody. Welcome to the Faculty of Science and Technology. Uh, we are really happy to receive you and we would like to thank uh, Professor Kari Merzini for once more do doing all the efforts he normally does in bringing us uh, students from abroad in these Erasmus Master's programs. Also, I'd like to thank uh, Professor Tim de Priest for uh, accepting to organize or to have the kickoff meeting in here at the University of Algarve. Well, the Faculty of Science and Technology of this university uh, is experienced in uh, uh, marine biology. Uh, we uh, have associated to the faculty the CCMAR, CIMA, which are research centers that are responsible for most of the research that is carried out at the faculty, not just research, but also technological transfer in the area of marine biology uh, and all that is associated to this area. We have actually uh, companies that have developed based on research that has been carried out at CCMAR and CIMA. So what we can offer you is an atmosphere of research and development, structured, promising, that is evolving with facilities in terms of equipment, with human resources that are widely recognized nationally and internationally. So I do hope that you feel welcome at this faculty. I do hope you like it and that in future, when you finish your master's, you can come back and you can recommend this as to uh, your friends. Well, I uh, would also like to thank Professor Ian Tim de Cox, who is going to uh, feature with a conference on fisheries. We have actually uh, some research in the area of fish fisheries. 
which is uh, the area of, uh, of Cari Merzini. And uh, that's, for the moment, all I have to do uh, and to say uh, to you, wishing you all the best and telling you that uh, whatever you need from the faculty, which I am here representing, you will have it. So any problems, any choirs, any anything you need, please come to see us and we are here to solve your problems. Thank you very much for coming. Good afternoon. I already introduced uh, Professor Anna de Freitas and the, uh, also the head of the faculty. But I also would like to welcome, very warmly welcome, the coordinators of the IMBRC partners. Karim Merzini is here, but the others are following online, or some are already on field work even today, together with students. They will, they promised this evening, maybe, or in the coming days, to watch this uh, official kickoff. Also, uh, a warm welcome. They're in the back of the, 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 the room here, but in a few days' time they will be in front of the room to the different teachers in this program. Also, a warm welcome to representatives from, from uh, some associate members that, uh, of the consortium, uh, but also you students. Uh, we already briefly talked an hour ago uh, because I hope you're aware that you will start two challenging years today. And then finally, also a warm welcome to all the supporters and colleagues from CCMR and all the partners of the uh, consortium. Okay, IMBRC, the International Master of Science in Marine Biological Resources. Maybe it's already a bit better than the previous master program, the Erasmus Mundus Master of Science in Marine Biodiversity and Conservation. It's almost impossible to, to, to pronounce this in one breath. So, we decided to make the name at least a little bit shorter. No, although officially, and you already mentioned it, uh, today we celebrate the start of a new master program. We could also say that at the same time, we celebrate the 10th anniversary of collaboration in marine education between several key universities in uh, Europe. Around 10 years ago, uh, a consortium of six universities, the University of the Algarve was included, Ghent University, Oviedo University, uh, University of Klaipeda in Lithuania, Bremen University and the University of Pierre Marie Curie in Paris, decided to join forces in their marine educational uh, programs. The Erasmus Mundus Master of Science in Marine Biodiversity and Conservation, EMBC, was born. With support of the Erasmus Mundus program, top students of the world could be attracted to come and study in the program. However, from the first year onwards, EMBC wanted to be a program not only designed for students that got a scholarship from Erasmus Mundus. And actually we managed, and we managed in such a way that on average we could attract around 50 students uh, that started the program. And as such, we could state at that moment that EMBC was the biggest master program in the field of marine sciences, the biggest international master program in the field of marine sciences in the whole of Europe. 420, I know 210 on average came to uh, the University of the Algarve, but in total 420 students have since the start of the program studied in the master program. Now, um, the EMBC program was in the past 10 years uh, not only a kind of an, a master program, but was also the cradle for a wide range of uh, other activities. Teacher exchanges, I several times came, for example, to the Algarve to teach here, but vice versa, Professor Margarita Castro, for example, came to Ghent, and before the start of this program, for example, these exchanges were actually not existing even. Uh, summer and spring schools, where we not only did teaching together, so it was not only a program where we had several universities, we also teach together, were kind of the, the most fruitful events from the, the past years. We had a high rate of publications of master theses, so uh, it's about 30% of all the master theses in this program, in the former program, that got published, which is a, a kind of a high range in uh, overall. Uh, it was also a doctoral program, the Maris doctoral program, which was actually born from this, this master program. And also we had lots of innovative teaching projects that found a place 
and it uh, may be most of all EMB set. EMBC led it through the new educational and scientific collaborations that were before none or hardly existing. Times are changing, minds are changing, but also the seas are changing. So two years ago, we decided to start writing a new chapter in our story of educational collaboration. A big group of graduates from the program did relatively easy find jobs or PhDs. I say jobs or PhDs because PhDs, as I just mentioned to the students, students as well, should be considered as another part of education. And it's always interesting to see, and uh, after let's say those PhDs, where people end up. Now, however, when analyzing the available vacancies uh, in, uh, in the field of marine sciences, we saw that there was kind of a growing mismatch between the structure of the program and the wide variety of new emerging jobs in the field of marine biological sciences. So in this new program, with its five specialization tracks, ranging from marine food production over conservation to studying the changing and future oceans, uh, hopes to provide kind of an answer to this mismatch. Not only the thematic specialization, but also elements like the ob obligatory professional placement, or um, the innovative summer schools, or the, the multidisciplinary approach, the involvement of more in universities make this program a real new educational initiative with many potential for the future, as I believe. Now, dear students and teachers, this is a slide, and you, uh, I think most of you know it already. This is the magical slide of which a colleague that is also here in the room spent lots of hours in order to create something that could represent uh, the, the whole program. So um, you will be key players in this IMB uh, RC program. And it seems important these days that you are able to pack messages in uh, very few characters, some, some even presidents do it uh, these days, they just uh, send out short messages. I thought that it's also important for you that you know in some keywords what this program stands for. So what is IMBSC? First of all, it's a joint program. So joint is a keyword. Nine universities, so Ghent University, University of Pierre and Marie Curie, University of the Algarve, University of Oviedo, Galway Mayo Institute of Technology, University de Bretagne Occidentale, University of the Basque Country, the Polytechnic University of uh, De La Marche, and University of Bergen organized together one master program. This is one of the biggest consortia that are existing, spread of all, all, all over Europe, that actually uh, teach together one program. Second keyword, it is represented and it's supported by the EMBRC, another acronym that you will learn in the coming uh, uh, months for sure, the EMBRC S3 Research Infrastructure, which is a huge uh, uh, research infrastructure in which CSMR is also very active. We're also from Ghent, for example, very active in it, uh, but it provides the students uh, an infrastructure of research institutes for example, for thesis work, for uh, internships, for all these kind of activities. So, and it's also a direct link uh, in terms of future employment. Third keyword, it's Erasmus Mundus or Erasmus Plus. So you're a member of the Erasmus Plus program, which is kind of a label that is uh, throughout Europe, but also globally quite recognized. So as future students, if you can say, if you go for a job somewhere in Canada within two years, I've been uh, uh, following an Erasmus Mundus or an Erasmus Plus program, then in Canada they know what kind of uh, program this is. Fourth keyword is, um, I just put it this scheme, uh, is the obligatory mobility. As I mentioned already, you have to be mobile. Students have to be mobile and uh, switch from university to university, and in this way also kind of learn cultural differences and teaching differences uh, between the different partners in the program. Fifth keyword is this one. It has five specializations, all related to marine biological resources. So we look at the marine biological resources from different angles. And this figure just represents the, the, the jobs and the spread of jobs, let's say, in the five uh, specialization tracks we have. And this is based on uh, an analysis of uh, the, the European database for where the job position, the uh, Euraxis database. Uh, so it's kind of a representation of the, the, the different uh, uh, mobilization tracks we have. And finally, I think, 
this graph unreadable, but that's the aim, yeah? Because it's the largest master program globally in this thematic area. We have nine leading universities, at least 50 associate partners all over the world, over 100 teachers, and in this first year, already 97 students from 31 countries, and that's what you see actually there, the 31 countries that are represented. So um, if you would try to, to kind of summarize it in a tweet, yeah, you could say kind of IMBSC, yeah, let, uh, you're, a, you're a member of the largest uh, program globally. So I just for those that are not used to tweeting, for example, for those that are used to tweeting, already made a text that fits within a normal tweet. So uh, feel free to, to spread the word and uh, feel free to know and then use IMBSC and be proud to be a member or to be a partner or a teacher in this uh, program. As coordinator of this uh, quite big and challenging initiative, I would like to express the hope that in the coming years, IMBSC will be a program that will train marine scientists that are ready to fit in the needs of the changing job market. I hope that IMBSC will function in a spirit of openness and respect, and that via these values, coordinators, teachers, students, academic services will be happy to work in and for the program and that they may really feel part of it, because that's a, a key and criti critical thing. If you feel part of it, you will be uh, much happier also to contribute it in the best way you can. Before giving the floor to Dr. Ian Coates from the University of Hull, I would like to thank some people that have in the past years played a critical role in order to establish this master program. Coordinators, legal representatives, academic services that helped in designing the program and getting it all approved at different levels. This sounds easy, but this is not easy at all. In nine universities, to get legal representatives to sign consortium agreements, for example, is uh, a challenge, I can assure you. If you have to meet, for example, France with Norway, with Belgium, with Portugal, then this creates sometimes uh, strange uh, situations. Now, um, teachers, thanks for daring to teach in this program, because you had to review and change your courses. Yeah, we are fully aware of that. And we hope that uh, uh, by this kind of uh, challenge you take, that you will uh, really be a, a, an important and critical uh, element to the program. Also, thanks to the people at the coordination office that are taking this challenge with passion and always try to help find solutions to the hundreds of crazy questions and problems that arise. I won't name these people, they know who they are, so thanks for this. And I would like to st st end by just uh, stating again what is, the is there. Be proud to be a member of the biggest joint master program in marine biological resources supported by Resumus Mundus and the e EMBRC uh, network. Thanks a lot. Okay, now it's time for some science, if I may say so, maybe not, or it's change, uh, time to challenge you, uh, all of you. And so I'm uh, very happy to, to give the floor to Dr. Ian Coates from University of Hull, which is in the north of uh, England. Yeah. Um, um, they're not a member. Yeah, they're not a member of this consortium as a university, but maybe that's something we have to discuss about uh, during uh, the reception afterwards this, uh, uh, this meeting. So uh, we'll be very happy to listen to your talk now. Can I take that out? Yes. Hello. Just trying to sort out the logistics because I, I'm awkward. I want to stand here. Um, just while he's setting it up, um, 
as Tim said, um, I'm from the University of Hull in the north of England on the east coast. Uh, we're in a very remote part of the world called Britain, uh, which now feels a bit excluded from all of this. So uh, I'd like to thank Tim and Green uh, for inviting me here to, to open this uh, session and also find a little bit about the programme. I knew a lot about the previous programme, I knew what I did. So it's been, it's been uh, nice to learn from this. Um, I might get a talk in a minute. Yeah? I don't know what we're uh, it's, on, I, it's on the PowerPoint down here. Oh, yeah, that will be. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Okay, um, what I want to talk about is perhaps a little bit outside your comfort zone. Um, based on a lot of the work that I've been doing with international agencies like the uh, UNFAO, the National Organization, World Bank, um, an organization called Worldfish, which is a very big. Um, non-government organization based out of Malaysia. Uh, and what we're actually doing is looking at the role of the Sustainable Development Goals, which is a fairly new initiative that's come out uh, building on the Malayan Development Goals that came out of the year 2000. And I want to relate it to fisheries in particular. And what I want, actually want to do is, during this uh, next uh, 35, 40 minutes or so, is actually look at um, what are the UN Development Goals, the Sustainable Development Goals, I am not sure how many of you know much about them, so I just want to go into them and actually sort of dissect them a little bit in relation to fisheries. I want to actually look at how fisheries really can contribute to them um, and how they're a little bit ignored within the development goals. I then want to have a look at how fisheries is under a lot of pressures, um, which will mean that we can't necessarily achieve the development goals. And then finally, how can we actually start to manage it? So I'm moving away from the ecological aspects of it, but looking at the management aspects uh, uh, more. And that's the sort of area I tend to work in. So what are the SDGs? Um, they're ambitious to say the least. The overall game is to end poverty. And in the places of what I work out, I work very much in developing, the developing world where poverty is rife, where about 60% of the people I uh, work with live on about $1 a day. Uh, I know you can do that in uh, Faro, but you shouldn't, couldn't do it in Ghent or London. Um, but the reality is, you know, we've got to help these people and it's a large proportion of the population. We also want to protect our planet. Um, I don't know if Donald Trump's listed or tweeting on this, um, but he doesn't understand what protecting the planet is, and we do, I, at least I hope we do. Uh, and I, we also want to ensure prosperity for all, and that is all. Those, that's those millions and billions of people who are on the poverty line uh, that don't live in America and don't believe in climate change. Um, okay, so what are the SDGs? There are 17 of them, and they're broken down into a whole series of uh, um, different aspects. Uh, the colouring on here is gone, unfortunately. Uh, but they move from things like no poverty and zero hunger, very important aspects in the world, uh, where we've got to ensure that people have enough food and enough money or livelihoods to, um, to live in a pleasant, pleasurable way rather than actually under stressed environments and, uh, and ill all the case. Then you go through education, gender is always in here. Um, but it comes down actually, in relation to fisheries, there's only really two key elements in here, doing Donald Trump here. Um, it's basically these two, uh, 14 and 15, where 14 is life below water. And it is basically all about conserve and sustainable use of oceans, seas, marine resources for sustainable development. So there are a whole number of other subcategories in here, but the key element is to conserve our oceans, conserve our uh, marine environment, and conserve the resources that come out of them. Exactly what you're going to learn a lot about over the next two years, I hope. Um, I put life on land in here because actually my expertise is more in fresh water than marine, so I feel a little bit of fraud being here. But actually, what I want to do is life in land, which actually has got fresh water hidden in it. Although, if you read it, you can't see it. If you actually go and read the documentation behind it, fresh water is in there, but not fresh water fish. And I will actually touch on fresh water fish a little bit because I think they're important as well as the marine environment. Okay, so what are the contributions to SDGs? Um, you see pictures like this all over the place in, in the literature, in, in videos, you name it. Um, lots of fish caught to supply lots of things. If I put it into reality, what's the source of fish to people's food security and their supply? And it's really important. Now, this 
study was done in 2007, and it's actually just being updated, I haven't quite got the final data. Um, it's out of FAO food uh, security data, but basically it tells you the story I want to tell you anyway. And here's the role of fish in contribution to people's um, food security. And they supply about 36% of the protein supply for, for the world population, which makes other supplies actually look into pay, or pale into insignificance. So they're not, they are the most important source of protein. So we've got to do something about protecting them and measuring them. I've put in here inland fish. As I say, I'm an inland fish person in the main. Um, but the inland fisheries is about 10, it's actually running at about 11.2 million tonnes now. The one thing about inland fish that we know, and also to marine fisheries, is actually they don't include two things. Recreational fisheries um, and recreational fish catch, and they don't include what we call small-scale subsistence fishing, where people will go down to the, the beach or go down to the sea, go down to the river, and catch fish and eat it there that day. It's not recorded. Nowhere is it recorded. If I actually put this on marine on inland fisheries, this value would probably go up to about 30 million tonnes because inland fisheries are very highly dispersed, living on bits of river which are never regulated, never controlled, and in the developing world in particular, people go down there and they'll catch uh, perhaps uh, three or four fish, pick them in the pond and that's in the pot, cook them and that's what they'll eat, and it's never ever recorded. There is a big study going on at the moment called the Hidden Harvest, which is actually an update on work that was done by the World Bank a few years ago, which I'm involved in to try and capture all this. And we reckon that fisheries, this percentage will go up. We can record these because you can see a pig, you can see a cow, you can't see fish. And this is one of the big problems that we've actually got. The other thing about it is the livelihood. Here's some statistics for you which might put fish in perspective and why I'm quite passionate about it is that there are about 38 million, uh, 35 million, 36 million fishes. These are people actually catching fish globally. It's quite a few people. About 90% of fisheries in Africa and Asia particularly are small scale. They are these small scale where people go out and catch small amounts of fish, such as you might see if you're here in the Algarve, where you've got these small fishing vessels going out, catching a small amount of that, um, sardine or something else. These are small scale. They're not the big commercial ones that you see on television where they're doing big trawling and all the rest of it. These are small scale, small nets, small gears, small operations, which are not bringing lots of money in, but they can give you quite a reasonable livelihood. There's about um, uh, 500 million people globally who are dependent on those fisheries. That's 8% of the world population depend on fish. That's huge. It's one of the most important livelihoods globally. So it's extremely important that we actually protect them. Um, Small-scale fisheries, going back to it, it represents about 30% of the world capture. So 70% is caught in the big oceans, these big fleets. But actually, the important part is that, the, that about 30% is small-scale, but the number of people involved in it is also extremely high. So it might be, it's a disproportionate amount of people working in um, small-scale fisheries against those working in large commercial fisheries. When you've got these big commercial vessels, basically you've got few people on them uh, and they're catching a lot of fish. There's these small-scale, which are um, many, many people working them, but they catch only about 30% of the fish. <coughs> Most of the fish is landed for human consumption, and this is critical. Uh, because we're not wasting the fish, as you may get some of the big major commercial fisheries like you get the Peruvian anchovy fishery, when it goes into fish feed or something else. This is for people to eat. There is a, in most of these small scale fisheries, there's very little wastage because they can't afford to throw it away. So it's again important. Um, they are actually in rural communities, and particularly when you're in the developing world, a lot of these fisheries are um, the only place people can go and get food, they can get a job, get their livelihoods. So they're extremely important to vast parts of the world, and I'll show you a map in a second. And if all else fails, where do people go? They go fishing. So after you've had the storms and the hurricanes going through the, the Caribbean, what are those people going to do? Their livelihoods are gone. They can't go back to tourism because there's nothing left. I guarantee that the majority of those people will go to fishing. When we had the big tsunami that took out um, Indonesia, the Boxing Day tsunami about 10 years ago, those people went fishing. 
They actually shifted from all their other activities, agriculture and everything else, because there was nothing left for them. They went to fish, because the fish are still left. Ironically, they don't get sucked up by the hurricane and thrown down. Um, so they go in there, so it's a last resort, so they're extremely important. And this gives you an idea of the dependence on, on small-scale fisheries uh, and how they're important. And actually, the thing to look at is the hatched lines. The white, actually, um, it says small amounts of, uh, of fish being eaten, but actually, these are a lot of data missing. Uh, there are a lot of data gaps. But the important part is these hatch lines where the contribution of fish to, the, to food security is very important. And you can see it's all through the developed world, where many people are dependent on fish. The bottom line here is that we've got to recognise that this is an important source of food, but it's also a bit beyond that. And every looks at this protein, actually fish is far more important than protein, it's also equally important for things like micronutrients. If you take a small little sardine and you eat the sm these small ones, like this size, there's enough manganese in the eye of that sardine to eat them whole to meet your daily food supply. If you take that out, what are children in particular going to deal with? They also eat the calcium that in the bones. And what we're finding is that the uh, fish in places like Bangladesh, the kids in places like Bangladesh, actually are now getting a disease which was common, I wasn't saying my young days, but I'm not that old. Um, but the reality is, when you're going back 100 years, they had a disease called rickets, which basically didn't get enough calcium, and their bones didn't form very well, and they're all walking like this. And that's coming back, basically because the fish is not being, uh, it's not being provided to those children, so they're not getting the calcium, they're not growing properly. So the fundamental big issues behind why we need to attack the fish, not just the food, but for other aspects of food security. The other thing about, uh, about this is that, um, Fish have a very small environmental footprint, and I always think that's very important. This is a, an idea of the, the process, and we've actually taken this a, a step further, which I'll mention in a second. But basically, if you have a look at beef, saw very high on that list, pork, look at how much water you require to produce 40 grams of protein. It's a huge amount. Beef is high. And basically it's high, not just because you've got to, the cattle to be free, it's because you've got to produce the food to feed the cattle. And that's where all the water supply comes from. There's fertilizers, pesticides, antibiotics, soil loss, look at them all. Horrible. Look at fish. Yes. This is why fish is so important to us, that we've actually only used a little bit of water, and that's for processing, when you're cleaning the fish out, basically. But it's a bit... Not quite as good as that because actually you've got to catch them and there are issues about the capture side, but it, it looks nice. Um, but the idea, I think you get the general idea. The other thing about fish and poverty, to give you an idea of the role of fish in relation to poverty, I love this graph, which is actually, um, this is the proportion of uh, fish protein in the diet versus the gross domestic product, how much per people in a particular country earns. So you can see that the people earn very little in a particular country versus the protein take, say, and what you've got is this lovely, sorry, that was meant to be red. Um, so you've got this lovely decline where the richer you are, the less dependent on fish you are. And actually, the people that eat fish in the, in the more prosperous countries are very wealthy and they buy the high quality fish. They bring it in from external sources, depleting the source for the poor. So, we do have a problem, I'll come back to that a little bit later. Just to touch on recreational fishing, just to, to wrap up uh, this part. Recreational fishing, again, sorry about the colouring, but the, the darker shading basically shows you where recreational fishing participation is very high um, and how important it is. There's lots of people dependent on this and about 7% of the world population actually uh, goes recreational fishing. It can be very high. Places like Finland is very high. Uh, North America, very high. Australia, very high. Lots of people go it. It is a very big source of livelihoods. People will pay lots of money to go fishing. And I say, I live just here, um, I'm just north of us in Scotland. And if I told you that people would pay about 5,000 euros per day to go fishing, and the chance of catching a fish is about 30 cents, you know, you can see where there's money floating around in the rural homes. These are rural people in areas which don't have a lot of income. So to go and catch salmon, um, you know, you have to pay a lot of money to, to deal with it. Actually, all those people come from here. It's called London. They're wealthy, rich, and... Oh, sorry. Um, um, 
I, I hope they're not recording me. <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't say it quite. Um, but the reality also is actually how many people um, and how much fish is caught by recreational fisheries. I did a study a number of years ago, and we probably need to update this. Um, but we estimate that about 47 billion fish are caught by recreational fisheries in those countries that we know about. Not the countries we don't know about. If I go back, this doesn't include all this area where there's a huge amount of fishing taking place we know nothing about. So 47 billion fish is a lot, about 17 billion retained, and the value, $200 billion. If you want to get into fisheries, that's where I go, personally, um, because that's where the big money can potentially be if you organise these things. Okay, so how do we deal with sustainable development goals? I, I mentioned them before, and actually, does fisheries contribute to them? I mentioned these two, where actually looking at the, the contribution, but really, it, is, it goes beyond that. And this won't show very well because of the, uh, the colouring. Uh, but basically, fish is very important for livelihoods and food security, which covers these five goals. So we're actually making a major contribution towards um, uh, poverty, hunger, um, well-being because of the nutritional aspects. And I've also put educational quality because it provides food. Therefore, you can get the children's education improving. Um, People associated with fisheries, actually, the education systems are, uh, are improving dramatically and it's also reducing the equality. You can also look at sustainable fisheries, I'll just show you that again. So, sustainable fisheries covers these aspects, um, including climate change, responsible consumption, production, all sorts of aspects. So, fisheries is, is getting deeply embedded. Women are down here. So, they're over here, gender equality and reduced inequalities, because women are involved. There was about 50% of women are involved in fisheries in general. Um, and they do things like the processing, the marketing, the selling, and everything else, and they look after the money. And finally, you've got fisheries depriving environmental quality. It does. Fisheries, the looking after fisheries means we look after environment. So we have a, a whole series of things that we're looking at. The problem is, what's the status of our fishery? And our world fisheries. This is the worrying bit. These are the data, again, colouring is not, not to conviction. See, this is basically the uh, marine capture fisheries, and you can see this is FAO statistical data, um, which you have to take the pinch, pinch of salt, um, but it gives you an idea of what's going on. And basically, it's been going up since the 1950s to about the 1990s when it's been stable. And actually, the, the fisheries have been, immense, have been stable for that long uh, because what we're doing is we're actually changing the way we exploit them. And you hear lots and read lots about fisheries being on the decline, and that's probably true in some cases, but not all. And there's two um, camps on this, one that says there's not a problem, one that says there is. But basically what you've got is a, an increase, uh, a, a stabilisation, so marine fisheries are not going to deliver much more. What is happening is this, these. This is freshwater and marine aquaculture, which are increasing quite dramatically. And they're actually contributing now about 50% of the aquatic products um, globally. Freshwater fisheries actually here is just going up. And actually this increase is caused by one thing only. And we think it's been stable for a very long time because we're getting better reporting. Um, whereas in this case, we've had good report, we have reasonably good reports. But the key is aquaculture is taking place. And I'll come back to aquaculture, whether it's an important element. But what you tend to see when you look everywhere, the doom and gloom story, this, this is typical uh, of what's going on. Um, Myers, uh, Random Ma Rand Myers produced all these data to basically show that virtually all the stocks are on decline. Um, and what you're actually looking at is these um, marks, these coming down here, uh, represent the mortality, fishing mortality, and it's actually getting higher and higher. And in reality, about 31% of our stocks are unsustainably fished, 58% are fish to, to the maximum, and only about 10% are not fully exploited. And these are deep water fisheries, offshore fisheries that we can't get access to very easily, and that's probably the reason for it. Um, the other thing I would want to point out is what's the cause behind it? And here gives you an example, and again, I can't show you this too well, but, but this is in 1900, this is the biomass of uh, fish in our North Atlantic uh, systems. And you can see the deeper the colour, the more fish we had. So that's 1900. The data in 1999 shows a subtle difference. It's all gone. It's been fished out. The cause is fishing pressure. 
Fishing exploitation, and it's actually coming from different parts of the world. It, it, in the 1950s, it was Europe fishing in, in uh, this part of the world, particularly to give you an example. Whereas now, in the North African, the, the source of uh, exploitation takes place from all of European systems, but also everywhere else, Russia, um, the Middle East, the Far East, all coming to exploit these fisheries. So fishing pressure on it is huge, basically to meet demand for fish and from regions beyond um, where it used to be. So it's a big problem. That then causes something else, I'm sure you'll learn lots about it if you don't know already, which is a concept called fishing down the food web. And what we're doing is basically exploiting our fishery, and we're taking out the high value fisheries, such as the tunas and all those, and reducing their, their capacity and their availability. And we're being left with small fish. And that's actually what is happening in many fisheries in the world. We're reducing uh, the high value stocks and, and fishing down and leaving smaller, less valuable fish. But it's still protein. But what do we do with that protein sometimes is a question. And quite a lot of the time we take it and we then you convert it into fish meal and then into other fish pro food products, um, such as feeding cattle, feeding chickens and feeding fish, um, which is rather bizarre. So what do we do to this decline in fishery? Basically, um, we have a series of regulations which have been around for as long as I can remember, and probably beyond it. Uh, some of the work I've been looking at, you see fishing regulations, these fishing regulations in the literature in, in the late 1800s. And what we tend to do is we have these general activities such as we close areas of fit from fishing, we close seasons for fishing, so when the fish is spawning, we tend to close the seasons. We tend to have a catch limit. We tend to do something to regulate the fishing pressure, so allowing people access or not, putting licensing systems in. We control the type of gear we operate and also the size of fish we can catch. These are general regulations that we've actually got. They've been around for many, many years. The problem is, they're just simple input, what we call input-output management tools, where you control um, what you do and you control what comes out. They're not controlling the bigger picture. And actually, are they appropriate for the SDGs? And I would basically say no. And I'll show you why. Um, this is the fishing down the food web. When you actually have a look at it, this is actually the fishing process, but beyond it, there's a lot more taking place. We actually having, having a lot of things like habitat destruction, um, change the biological interactions. With this fishing down the food web, you're changing the whole ecosystem functioning. And therefore you're changing many other dynamics of fishery, and that's having a big impact. Uh, we have things like bycatch, uh, where we're catching um, animals and turtles and birds and things that we shouldn't, what we shouldn't be looking at. So it's much more than just fishing that's actually uh, acting on it. And I'll show you some of these now. So here's the, some of the impacts of uh, fishing that you've actually got on. Um, here's the, the fishing. We have a thing called discards where a high proportion of fish are thrown back. Fortunately, the European Union has seen sense recently and has changed the whole regulation so you're not allowed to have discards. The one problem that creates is that the fishermen catch their quotas quicker and therefore report longer and therefore that they're uh, wasting money while their boats are, are basically moored up and they can't go and catch anything. You've got the fishing impacts, which are destroying habitats. So you're going from a nice coral or seabed uh, bottom to a floor which has just been flattened. Okay, fish can go and feed on what's flattened and left, but actually it, it does quite a lot of damage. You've got things like ghost fishing, where we leave nets behind. Uh, fish are caught randomly, uh, sharks and things are caught randomly and lost. And then you've got the bycatch of mammals, birds, turtles, you name it. Huge impact on our environment. And we need to really do think more than just think about fishing. One of the ways we actually do it is have protected areas. And marine protected areas are big. Uh, these have the, the basic premise that we actually leave an area so nobody can fish in it, so the fishery recovers. And then they swim out and then actually they get into the, into the uh, main fishery and then they're exploited. The fish will actually sit right on the boundary and capture the fish as it steps across. It's a bit like you're walking up the stream and somebody will catch you immediately. Uh, so for the word, I'm not a great advocate of them, I'm afraid. Um, I think there are better tools to actually deal with this. Um, but they have a function. The trouble is, every season has, has a mechanism. And this is actually the global, sorry, this is the 
This is the global um, number of MPAs that have been set up, and every blue mark you've actually got here represents uh, a marine protected area. So it's protecting huge amounts of, uh, um, of marine environment, particularly coastal environments, but is it doing any good? I've not seen much change in, uh, around the uh, UK as a result of it, or even around uh, the North Sea where we work. We see no effect whatsoever in it. But one thing it does do, it excludes fishermen from fishing. So what do they do? So it's making fishermen poorer. And if you go around this part of the world, it's definitely doing that. It is making the fishermen poorer because they don't have access to the resource and they don't have that access to that dependence on it. Other things we do, we do certification of seafood. Um, Marine Stewardship Council is the well-known one which we actually certify the fisheries as being sustainable. Um, yeah, I'll say no more because um, I'm on camera. Um, yeah, it's a good idea. And the concept is there if it's implemented properly. We also have other pressures, and many of you have seen this. I'm sure you get a lot of this during your course, um, but there are lots of other pressures acting on the marine environment. Pollution, uh, port developments, marine aggregates. We do a lot of sand and, gra and gravel extractions, which can damage the, the benthos. The renewables are everywhere. Um, you see, this is tidal lagoons, this is wind power, they're everywhere. If you come up my, my coast where I live, there are just thousands of these things, and all has just become the green port because Siemens has moved in and we just build turbines, turbines, turbines now. Um, yeah, horrible. You get pollution, but this is also another big issue you now marine litter, plastics, microplastics, microbeads, all, all those sorts of things um, are becoming a big issue. These we've got to look after, as well as the fish, because these are influencing the fish. Climate change. Um, to quote Donald Trump, it doesn't exist. It's only in a Chinese, uh, it's a Chinese myth um, because it wants to ruin the US economy. And that's a real quote from him. Um, great, isn't it? Uh, but this is actually a uh, difference in air temperature between now and the end of this century and what will happen. You can see the global warming taking place. And these sorts of pressures are going to have an effect on our fisheries. They're going to influence our fisheries and what's there. How? We don't know. If you, I'm in an EU project called Ceres, which is all about climate change and fisheries, and we're actually trying to, to work out what will actually happen. Um, and it, the story's not good, let me put it that way. Um, so how will it change? These are, these are sort of ideas that you tend to get. Um, so you're going to get change in the ocean transport systems, so you're going to get change in fisheries, and you're no doubt in of Portugal seeing change in your fish uh, uh, that are coming. We're finding things in, in, our, uh, in our waters which we've never seen before, sunfish and things, which is proper. They're African fish. We're actually catching them now in our fisheries. Um, we're getting a change again, things like jellyfish, masses and masses of jellyfish, which are, are okay to eat to the Chinese, but I'm not very fond of them. Um, but you get these fiscal changes which are causing all sorts of problems with changing distribution and abundance of fishes. You get oceanographic changes, particularly uh, acidification, acidity, we're seeing this as a big problem, and then that's leading to things like coral bleaching. Um, the fish distribution is changing, as, as I mentioned, and the food webs are changing. What we, we find is this jellyfish is proliferating, but the other thing that's also important to recognise is that invasive species are also moving in. And they're taking over, and there's a lot of damage being done in place that they made to this effect. Okay, so what are the solutions? I love this cartoon. Um, there are there problems in the world, I think there are, and if you listen to big politicians, they will tell you we have to forget fisheries, and fisheries is invisible. Um, so here's the my thoughts on potential solutions based on conversations with many other people. And before you ask me the question, there's the solution. Um, the answer to that. Okay, so what are, what's the solutions here? So where are the future scenarios? And what you've got to do is have a look at where marine fisheries are in relation to everything else that's taking place. And what I've put here is basically, this is the, the marine resources that you're all gonna listen to and be talked about over the next two years. But actually what's acting on it, and I've just put some of the activities, this is not exclusive because it'd, it'd be just a, a horrendous ground as a colleague of mine might get it, would say. Um, so you've got all sorts of things acting on those marine resources, including what normally drives it. But, so these are the main drivers that are influencing, and you get the products out, and the fishery, and the recreational activities, and all the rest of it. But what's also driving it is what we're doing, as human populations and societies changing. So we're actually shifting the quality by some of the activities I've just mentioned. 
We're changing the environment, and that's then influencing what we can get out of the system. With, and that is changing our biodiversity, our conservation, all the sorts of things you'll learn about on this course. Climate change is also acting on this and affecting it. So basically what we've got to do is, how can we not just work on fish, please go away from this course, and I'm sure you will, not thinking fish. Uh, think bigger. Open, think outside the box about everything that will act on fish and everything that will act on the marine environment. And actually I would suggest that what you've got to do though is recognise that you can't just stop everything. And this is the biggest fault that most people have. We all want to make sure our fish is there, our conservation is there, our uh, biodiversity is maintained, but actually you can't stop development. And certainly in many parts of the world, again, you can't touch it because we've, we've benefited from development. You can't say to them, these poor people, sorry, you can't develop, because we've done it and we've made mistakes. You can't preach to them. It's unfair put on them, and they will just ignore you and actually get deported out of countries, as I have. They throw out several sort of criticising various things. Um, but the reality is, you've got to work with the people, and I learned that a long time ago. So you have to learn with them, because we do need energy. We do need food, and we do need to improve our livelihoods. And that's what the SDGs are trying to show us. So how do you minimise this impact? And I would argue that actually you've got to look at the different domains of society to meet this. And what we've got is the ecology and the environment, which I suspect is mostly what you're going to learn in this, this course. But please don't de uh, detach it from the economic and social aspects that are very important, the domains. They are what drive, is driving society. And don't forget the politicians, because if you don't get them on your side, you're wasting your time if you want them to think you're going to go anywhere. Get the politicians on your side. Talk to them in a way that they can understand. Um, I won't make any comments on that, because it's been recorded. The reality is um, that you've got to make all these three activities and these domains work together. And you've got to maximise this area in the middle to maximise the positive interaction and minimise the, 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 uh, the negative interactions. And I would argue that what we also need to do is actually look at what the drivers, resilience and vulnerabilities of the fishery sector is in relation to all those other sectors I've talked about. We need to understand the fishery sector better. We don't know it very well, actually. And I always think that fishery science is actually where medicine was about 100 years ago. And it's been like that, and I've been teaching for 40 years, and it's been like that for 40 years. We really haven't moved forward that much. Uh, like medicine is going like this, fisheries is just on a steady track, unfortunately. So how can we look at this? And I just want to wrap this up by looking at this concept of vulnerability of fisheries, because when you're working with the people, as well as the resources, you need to look at it. And if you actually look at vulnerability assessment, these are the way it's defined by the UN under the SDGs and under the Millennium Development Goals and many other targets. And basically what you do with vulnerability is you're looking at the exposure to your resource by external activities. And these are things, the nature and degree of which um, your fishery is being exposed and changed by that exposure. You also you then relate that to what's called sensitivity. How can those fish, are they sensitive or are they not sensitive to, to change? There are many species that don't really care, they'll do what's, if it's the water's there, they'll be fish. There are some species that will disappear. The classic one being salmon, they, they need clean, fresh water, if they don't get it, they can't get access to their headwater streams, they, they disappear. And we do see those sorts of changes. So we're looking at ecosystem change and how those fish species or animal species, whatever you want, are, 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 um, are sensitive to that change. So exposure, the, the bad bit, its sensitivity, the relationship to it, add those together, it can give you the impact. So non-sensitive species uh, show less impact. So you, you're taking into account that uh, um, the, the potential impacts, but we also have this thing called adaptive capacity, where we can actually adapt to it. We can, and fish can adapt. They can change their breeding habitats, they, their habits. They can change where they breed. They're quite adaptable, and people are the same. So you've got the impact, but there's also the capacity to change a little bit. Take the impact, and take the capacity to change away, and you get this thing called vulnerability. The term of vulnerability is actually it deals with the resource, and you've got to also look at people. So it actually 
you can break it down into two uh, components. You've got the exposure sensitive e ecological impact up here and the ability to recover. And then you can link it into this ecological vulnerability and then the social impact. And the, the dependence of people on that resource affects how much will have an impact in, in terms of society. So if this is very vulnerable and we're very dependent on it, the impact's going to be huge. We do have the ability to adapt. We can change our fishing weapons. We can change the way, the way we operate. And that will give you an overall social ecological vulnerability, which we can then relate to that resource and relate to the capacity to, to achieve um, sustainable development goals. And I'm just going to go through these components very quickly with you. The exposure is fairly simple in terms of fish, it's exposure to exploitation patterns, climatic conditions, which we've all seen changing, uh, chlorophyll, tidal variation, these all influence your fisheries. A lot, no doubt, you've learned in your BSc, and no doubt you'll learn in, your, in your, um, this programme. This has big effects, though, on what's going on. We see things like coral breaching. This is, this is actually the um, overview of the roots and storms going through. There's Irma going through, um, just about to hit Florida, um, followed by, um, get the one song now, uh, RJ, uh, Jose, isn't it? And that's the previous one just going through there. So you get increased storm as we get in a lot more storms. You get things like coastal erosion processes. We are seeing quite lots of de degradation. Uh, this is just a simple coastline. But actually, you get erosion of uh, mega uh, coastlines. Important habitats for fish, mangroves in particular, get eroded. The Mekong um, Delta area, it's eroding by 10 metres per year at the moment. And that means all the um, mangroves are being washed away, and therefore all the fish production areas are being washed away. These are the sorts of effects and um, secondary effects that we actually get. We can then have a look at the sensitivity, and actually, we can look at this. this in uh, quite a nice way in relation to the abundance of fish, the distribution and their phenology. And phenology means how they can change their life histories. Can they breed earlier? Um, can they grow quicker? Can they get hit, um, get more eggs, uh, maybe smaller eggs and, and various things? So fish have the capacity to change. And you'll see this with many, many fish species. And this is a, a fish sensitivity analysis that's done by uh, Greg Pe uh, Peck. Peckle it and she did it in uh, Australian systems. And some species are highly sensitive and others are not. The worst part is the ones that are low sensitive tend to be invasive species. So they take over when you get this change. This is looking at distribution of Atlantic salmon in, across the um, uh, northern Europe. Um, and I think uh, anybody from Portugal will tell you that they probably don't exist down here anymore, as far as I'm aware. They're virtually extinct. Yeah. Now, Karim tried to catch them. But not successful. Um, so basically they're disappearing, that's due to climate change and moving north and, and other things like dams um, extracting. So we do have that effect. If you add that exposure and sensitivity together, here's, here's an example of the temperature effects I showed you earlier and the sensitivity effects. So these are, are sensitive to climate change, to temperature, these are very sensitive, so they'll disappear, these will actually um, probably sustain themselves, and that will give the impact of what species will disappear and what species will not. So that's the process you actually go through. Then you actually look at the, the ability to adapt, so we want to have a look at this, this process in here, the ability to adapt. And it really is a process that's trying to generate um, resilience. So how can we um, improve the resilience of the society so that we don't lose our fish, we don't lose our uh, marine, aquatic, marine resources? And there is potential to do this, and there's lots of potential to do this, but you've got to do it in a sustainable way and in an ethical way. We can do it the wrong way, um, and it's been done the wrong way in some cases. <coughs> so so Looking at that, we've got to look at the ecological vulnerability, so this is the impact, and look at the resource dependence. If you're very dependent on it, it tells you your ability to adapt. And actually, you can look at the economic dependence of, uh, on fisheries, and this is a good example. Again, showing the uh, amount of protein, this is the amount eaten against the GDP of countries. And this is the, uh, the proportion of uh, fish that's eaten and you can see that the poor countries of the world, the yellow ones down here, are the ones that are very dependent on fish and are very low income. So their dependence on fish is very high. So these are the people that are very, very vulnerable. 
to changing fisheries caused by societal change and climate change and the rest. We do have the ability to change and adapt, um, and we do have some capacity, and we do it through things like ecosystem management, um, lead to uh, uh, potential to improve, and these are some of the ones that I've been involved in over the years. Um, we actually, when we destroy some of our habitat in the UK, we have a new port development, a big one going in London, we actually put these things called managed realignment, where we take a part of the estuary and we reset it and re reconnect it back to the estuary. Um, to allow um, uh, replacement of the lost habitat. Reinstate mangroves, this happens all over the place. They're rebuilding mangroves because we realise how important they are to fisheries. We put in artificial reefs, we put in protected areas. We even stock, which to me is a nonsense, but actually uh, we stock lots of fish, lobsters and all sorts to try and improve our fisheries. Does it work? There's not a lot of evidence that it does, but it does make people feel good. The other one is you've got marine station planning and those aspects coming forward uh, where we're trying to manage the whole system, not just fisheries, but everything else that's going on. Whether it works is open to debate, but it's a big part of the EU initiative, so I don't put it in there. Not that Britain's part of it anymore. Um, we look at alternative food systems. So if you lose your fish, what else will you put in, in its place? This is a classic example. This is rice production in the Delta, in the Mekong Delta. Um, this represents a wall they built to this, this, well this is the flooding, and this should be flooded. And to make sure they get plenty of rice production, it disconnects the floodplain. Therefore we disconnect the fish um, production habitat. So the fishery is collapsing, and the rice production is going up. Rice is worth nothing, fish is. Rice, it's all exported, so it's all for profit by a few. So you've got to think of these things. The other one is aquaculture. We seem to be going towards aquaculture. Is aquaculture the, um, whatever he calls it to be, the silver bullet? Um, just to mention it, um, so here's the silver bullet of aquaculture. We reckon that about 50% of all fisheries production is going to come from aquaculture by the year 2025. Okay, that sounds great, but there's a whole series of other things that are taking place. Many of it's fresh water, and it, I don't know whether you eat fish, but I prefer marine fish, fresh water fish any day, uh, for, ob for obvious reasons, with the taste and the texture. Um, but also, a lot of it's going to be in developing countries, so how is it going to help us? You're probably actually eating some of the fish from developing countries, you're probably eating a species called uh, um, Pangasius that comes from the Vietnamese Delta. Uh, if you do, uh, I forget what, don't know what to call it down here, river cobbler, or something like that, there's lots of different names. If you do eat it, um, I'll send you a video of why you don't want to eat it. Because uh, it's the most disgusting thing, and the, the water that's actually going into the fish farms is actually mostly comes straight out of um, industrial wastes. So it's pretty contaminated stuff. But yes, we're getting an increase in production quite rapidly. Um, the trouble is that aquaculture is very capital intensive, uh, intensive, and poor people are excluded. And they really are excluded. Very little of the poor people are eating aquaculture products because they can't afford it, because it's expensive. Um, you've got nutritional issues. Aquaculture product tends to give you the fish fillet, but you don't eat the bones, you don't eat the eyes, you don't eat those sorts of things. So you get nutritional problems. And that's a big problem in Bangladesh in particular. Um, you don't get the magnesium. And the other thing is that fish need feeding on fish. So you're taking out of the food chain, the human food chain, to feed fish. So you put the set in. And if you understand trophic cascading and all that, so you, that's actually a waste of energy. Um, so, I'm not an advocate of um, aquaculture necessarily, although there is a place for it in the right place. Um, the other one is actually diversification of people's livelihoods. How do you get these people who are dependent on um, fishing in a coastal area, what can they do? Where are they going to go? If you want to make them less vulnerable, you've got to find something else. And actually, it links to their ability to change, and most of them have no ability. They don't have any ability to change their jobs. So you've got to create jobs for them if you want to get them off the poverty line. Um, also, this is also related to the countries and the human development index in certain countries. So some of these poor countries of the world just don't have the capacity to change and never will have the capacity to change, even though the sustainable development goals are trying to move it here in that direction. Um, and do they have the assets? No. Most of them have a small net. Quite often they have the same net which is made up of mosquito, what we call mosquito nets, which is actually provided by the health people uh, to stop them getting malaria. So they don't actually use it to cover themselves at night, they actually go fishing with them. 
Um, and you see this all across Africa. And isolation is a, is a big problem. The other issue here is that affluence and, and poverty in this diagram, I can send you a copy of the paper, Karim, if you want to pass it around, um, is that poverty is actually driven by poor people because they don't have assets and they're only thinking about what they can get tomorrow. How are you going to eat tomorrow? They're not worried about two years down the line. So they will destroy the system. But also affluence destroys the system because basically we want to get access to those resources for people who can afford it. So the wealthy West can actually, actually exploit this and we do a lot of damage because we can afford it and we don't really care because it's not on our doorstep. We can learn lessons from um, resilience from other sectors, in particular in, in, in um, where I work, when we're building dams on rivers, we're actually seeing how fish, fish communities actually adapt uh, and change as a result of uh, building the dam and losing their fisheries. And these are things like um, going into aquaculture a little bit, but mostly changing to going to the construction industry or going into uh, farming in a different way and, and, and doing different products. Um, farming products, so they get their food in a different way. So to wrap up, um, what's the future for marine fisheries? Here we are in the middle, and here are sort of all the things that are impounding on it. Um, the trouble is that we've got weak governments of our fisheries, and particularly when you look at global fisheries, not necessarily European fisheries. The European uh, Union probably think they have a nice common fisheries policy uh, that works very well. well I would argue it doesn't. Um, and it's because, because of this we have quite a lot of our collapse in our fisheries. And I've stuck in corruption here, um, even though I was told by the UN to take it out when I, met, when I first presented this. Um, corruption is there everywhere. And if you don't deal with corruption, our fisheries are going to continue to decline. You've got, the fisheries is an invisible resource. We really don't know the value of it because we don't know what's coming out of the system very well. We can see the big marine fisheries and they catch it, we get a lot of information there. But the value of it we don't know. In the fisheries we really are in the blind at the moment. And there are lots of other things taking place, but we've got this uh, systematic decline in our fisheries which we're not really monitoring. Um, a lot of people argue that there is no decline, but others will argue there is. But basically there is change taking place. And you've got things like open access fisheries, what we call IUU, um, 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 illegal, unregulated, unreported fishing. This is huge in marine fisheries and, and particularly small scale fishing. Aquaculture is always seen as a viable alternative. And so people are saying that we'll do aquaculture and we'll, we'll, be, we'll be fine. I am not convinced by that. And now finally, one of the big arguments is that the agricultural sector says we don't care about fish. We can grow everything we want. But I hope I've argued that actually growing lots of rice, growing lots of corn, growing lots of wheat, actually doesn't provide everything that people need for their food. Um, you don't get the micronutrients, you don't get quite a few of the amino acids you need for healthy growth. So, um, it's not great. So just to wrap up and summarise uh, what, what I've just said, um, my personal opinion, and I hope you'll take this message from, from sort of being in the business for, for quite a while, Basically, you're going to do a lot of nice field experiments, you're going to do a lot of nice ecological studies, and you're going to do a lot of nice environmental studies. But please look at what you're actually doing it for. Shift it from collecting nice biological data, and actually shift it towards engaging with policy and development needs, so that your information is used. So think about what the next step is with your information. Fisheries management is just one tool in my mind, and there are many other tools out there we should be engaging with. So don't just think about fisheries management, think about everything else that's influencing the sector and manage as a whole, the ecosystem approach basically. Um, acknowledge that developments are taking place, and I've put in fish farming because of what I've said, um, and it will go ahead. You're not going to stop it, so work with it. And if you do, you should see some gains and not so many um, deteriorations, and you get the optimization of the resource. And finally, we've got to find a way of talking to the right people in the right places. We really do need to talk and communicate all your information you're going to gain from the next two years and your lifetime. Get it out there so people understand it and actually engage with it and link it to the SDGs, because I think it's important you do. And actually, the key element of engaging with it is actually to watch 
approach called the ecosystem service approach is basically you need to put value on all those resources you're dealing with. It's not just if you want your dolphins, you want your sharks, you want your fish. Put value on it because that's what politicians listen to. So on that I will finish and thank you very much. I hope you enjoy your next two years. It's, uh, it's going to be challenging for you. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? No burning questions. Yeah. No, no, wait, three years' time. Um, Sorry, I can't hear you. You've got a very internship topic at your university. You better talk to Korean about that. Um, yes, we do actually. We, I mean, I run a, a, an institute in the university. Most of our work tends to be in um, in fresh water because we we found a niche basically. But but we look at this type of work, so we we relate it to that type of thing. So yes, potentially there is feasibility. For sure, we have to talk on the coming NASA scheme number at least to go down to uh, to get a bit of infrastructure. Other questions? I don't know. Yeah. Working with the people, it's it's a very work at the bottom, work bottom up. Uh, I mean, most uh, management activities now it's always top down, and actually work with the people, find out what they want. This this drivers vulnerabilities, motives, what that is. Understand that first. Understand culture, and then understand how important it is to them, and then work upwards from that point. So work with the people. Don't go. Don't walk in there. I've got great Western ideas, you know, from the UK. Uh, we've managed our fisheries for donkey's years, badly. Um, but the reality is you go in there and try to pose on them, it never works. Work with the people, they know how these fisheries function, um, much better than I ever know. So we go in and actually, what I, t I tend to do is I go in and, and I sit there and I go, I thought about so-and-so, very quietly. And then you go back a couple, of, a couple of years later or a couple of months later and go, hey, I've got a great idea, how about, and you go, I've won. And so you see things. And don't try to impose things. It's much, much better. All right. Thanks for the talk. Okay. And uh, maybe we get now to the. We have to celebrate also things. And uh, also, let's say during the, the reception, which is just afterwards, I think there's still time to uh, interact and to uh, get this message, talking to people, how to see it all in a bigger picture. I think many of the messages we brought in two years' time. The, that there will be other reflections on it from many more questions and many more viewers. And thanks a lot. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay. All right, the official kickoff. Yeah, very important moment. How do you kick off things? And uh, people that uh, know me a bit uh, from previous years that have been also in Belgium, um, we try to celebrate things in, uh, in a way that. Yeah, you feel okay, yes, this is right, and uh, we can uh, remember things also in a good way. So, for this occasion, we asked Karim, can you uh, prepare a small reception? Yeah, Karim said, okay, good, good idea. And then we thought, okay, uh, doing a reception, um, lots of cups, lots of glasses, maybe plastic ones, I don't know, or carton ones. So we thought, let's do it in a sustainable way. And to give kind of an official kickoff, and I just would like to invent, uh, to invite also uh, the dean of the faculty here, and uh, the and uh, just to um, we we have some small presents, yeah, for everyone here present, yeah. So we have a reception in a very original way. Yeah. So we have the first person. You may open it. Yeah. Has not been no no students have this ever seen before, but I I think you will remember this reception as. Uh, so you all get a sustainable cup, which is true for me. So uh, hereby I think we can say that the uh, program officially uh, is started now. With the first lecture, you had information, you had background, we had features here, so you're all aware that's made this a successful thing, that's made this a live living thing. So thank you and enjoy your program. And, uh, 